And let me give you a little bit of theological background here because... Now, when I say theological background, please remember what I said at the, for, at the beginning of the course. This is not a work of theology. It is a very great quest narrative, um, the best that's been written since the Middle Ages. So I don't mean that Tolkien was absorbing whole shelves of theology and then figuring out how to allegorize it as, as, as a story about the races of Middle Earth. He hated that notion of, al of allegory. He just loathed it. He thought that the meaning of the story should be in the story. It was the story. It wasn't some kind of meaning that the story served as window dressing for. But once again, I'm going to keep insisting, it's the theme of the course, that when Tolkien gets us into certain binds, certain puzzles, certain deep problems about what's going on in the world of Middle Earth, that we have to reinvent theological notions to make sense of it. That's the whole point of his writing. He wants to show that the, the theological way of thinking about the world was always sensible and is, in fact, irreplaceable. You can't make sense of life as it matters to us without that kind of reasoning, but we have to do the inventing. We have to do the inventing. Now, the theological background to what that said, the theological background to what I'm about to say is this. There were, in the early church, the early Christian church, there were, there were two possibilities of accounting for evil. You'll hear um, Lewis talking about this a little bit in The Problem of Pain. And one was a concept of God just as I've described it to you. God, the, the theology in incredibly oversimplified form that I'm probably going to get struck down by lightning for simplifying in this way, but it goes something like this. Um, God at the beginning of time is alone, but being all good takes being alone, sharing, having the goodness of existence confined to himself or itself um, as being selfish. Somebody, a, a, a creator who is all good wants to share the goodness of existence, a being, with other creatures. Thus, in the Judeo-Christian story, the creation of the race of angels who turn against him and fall into hell. And then the second creation, which is us on earth, which is where Tolkien picks up. Now, in that story, God creates his creatures with free will for a complex theological reason, which I can really only sketch in... in, in uh, something like comic book terms. But the basic idea is this. If you create creatures... I mean, what I do when I'm teaching uh, Milton is I, is I pose a kind of false conundrum to my class. And the class, those of you who took 219 with me will remember this perfectly well. It's practically on tape inside my head. What I do is I say this. Suppose that God is all good and all powerful and he wants to share the goodness of creation with a, a race of beings that, that he puts into the universe, that he brings into existence in the universe who wouldn't have existed otherwise. If he's all good, why doesn't he just make them good? I mean, clearly, if we have an adequate conception of God, God doesn't, God doesn't like rape, he doesn't like murder, he doesn't like pillage, he doesn't like violence, he doesn't like all the things that human beings do to each other. If you're all powerful, just create people who don't want to do those things. It's the easiest proposition in the world, apparently. There is a kind of facile thing like that. And my students always immediately sense that there's something wrong with his proposition. It takes a while to see what's wrong with the proposition because it, they say, well, then they wouldn't have free will. But I'm saying, that's what I'm, I'm saying. Why is free will necessary? Or why not make the will of these creatures just what always wants the good? They want to be decent to each other. They want to be honest with each other. They want to be loving to their fellow, fellow human beings. And then usually in this class when we're talking about it, somebody says in a kind of bemused way, but wait a minute, in that case, God wouldn't really be creating anything. In that case, God wouldn't really be creating anything. And that's the essential theological point. If God had created a race of beings who only wanted to do good, who didn't have the power to do anything but what God wanted, God simply would have created extensions of himself, in effect robots, just emanations of his own will. It would be just as if I created uh, technological extensions of my own powers, like a microscope or whatever, but I control the, 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 the joystick or the game stick or whatever the hell they call the stick. Um... The, the point is that God, to really create creatures, to, say, to create creatures, has to create them with free will, and free will has to include the possibility of, of, his, of their turning away from him and beginning to set themselves up as gods. That's the beginning, that's the sin of pride which begins all sin, which begins all sin. Now, that's the, that's the orthodox story that Tolkien bought um, and considered an adequate explanation. There's another ancient possibility. It's called Manichaeanism which is that um, there isn't just one God. There are two mighty spirits in the world, one which is evil and one which is good. And they're constantly at war. They have been through all time. And uh, this is, it has its roots in, in Zoroastrianism, in, in, in ancient Persia, 
Um, there are Christian versions of it. It's a Christian heresy. Heresy. The Albigensians in early medieval Europe, late medieval Europe, I'm sorry, um, also shared a version of Manichaeanism. It's a constant temptation within Christian theology, and as far as I know, I haven't asked any of my Jewish friends about this, but I, but but I'd be very surprised if there weren't a Jewish version of it, a Judaic version of it. Um, it's a very simple. It's a very simple and very simple and satisfying explanation of the world to see us as caught in this war between two cosmic beings, one of who's constantly fighting to bring evil into the world and to make us do evil things and to cause wars and so on, and uh, another force, the force of light, fighting that by, f- by trying to get us to... We do feel very caught between the two, two forces sometimes, and, 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 and it can... Now, the temptation of uh, Galadriel... It is a temptation scene. Frodo offers her the ring. It's an amazing moment. Frodo offers her the ring, and he really offers it to her. It's, it's this extraordinary moment. I mean, he, he, he's clutched it to himself. He's subject to all these injunctions. Gandalf says, don't put it on, accept it, need. He goes through the thing with Bombadil where he wants to see if it's real, and so he puts it on after Bombadil has tossed it in the air and so on. And here he is. He's so overcome by the power and goodness of this, this woman. By the, by the something like supernatural power and supernatural goodness of this, this elven queen, that he says, here, lady, take the ring. It is too great a matter for me. Take the ring and use it. You will defeat Sauron. You will defeat Sauron. And then you'll set up a good world in its place. And he has to be taught by two things, by Galadriel. He has to be retaught the lesson, which Gandalf started teaching him all the way back in the Shire, which is that the ring would go to work on her, and pretty soon you'd have a, a, a dark queen rather than a, a dark lord. But the second, the second thing that we have to learn along with Frodo is what I call um, Tolkien's renunciation of Manichaeanism. Now, this again is a purely narrative problem as well as a theological problem. Tolkien is telling a Manichaean story. He, that's, why, that's why people unsympathetic to Tolkien's kind of writing, which most people raised on literary realism are, I mean, there are lots of English professors who, who, who despise Tolkien because they think he wrote a children's story. I, I, I mean, I think they're assholes, but... Uh, no, I mean, I don't... Uh, that's, uh, that's a term of art in literary criticism. I think that they, they have what Charles Lamb called a failure of sympathy. There was an American critic named Edmund Wilson who wrote one of the early reviews of um, The Lord of the Rings... And he just derided it. I mean, he made fun of it. The title of the review was, Ooh, here come those awful orcs. You know, well, I hope he's revolving in his grave wherever he is, Edmund Wilson, um, because he represented precisely, read Hecate County, the one novel he ever wrote. It's pure. Um, he, he couldn't carry Tolkien's typewriter ribbon. But, but the point is that there is, there is when, when these people raised on, on literary realism, modern literary realism, do see Tolkien as telling an oversimplified, almost comic strip story. The war of good against evil. There's this dark tower, and there's this dark force in it, and then there's the forces of the free people, and so on and so forth. There is a Manichaean element to the, to, to the story. It is the story of something like absolute good against absolute evil. That's one of its attractions. Tolkien's trying to restore that possibility to the, to the world of narrative consciousness in an age which doesn't want to hear about it. But he doesn't want us then to take what he takes as a narrative reality, the absolute evil over there in Barad-dur, our little company of, of heroes setting forth over here in, in Rivendell, and everything that develops in between. He doesn't want us to take what he takes as, as, as a primary narrative reality, this is how the characters inside the story invent it, as what he takes to be the theological reality. The theological, re- theological reality is absolutely anti-Manichaean. It is not that Sauron, an absolute power who's existed, who would be Manichae, the, the power of darkness, exists over there for all time, and the forces of the li- the force of light behind it all is Iluvatar over here, and they're fighting an eternal war between the two things. The story says that. That's how the characters experience it. But the reality that underlies the story, and this is the moral psychology of the ring again, is that evil has nothing to do with Sauron. It has nothing to do with Sauron. It has nothing to do with whatever principle of absolute evil has shown up in this particular age of the world, in the second age or the third age or the fourth age. Evil starts in our hearts. Evil starts in our hearts. That's what the ring represents. It is the power of producing the Morgoths and the Saurons of any age of Middle-earth 
out of the dark impulses of our own earth, uh, of our own hearts. It's it's the bad choice of the the the, the will that came to us, uh, that was given to us along with our rational consciousness. Now take Galadriel's r renunciation of the ring as a renunciation now of the Manichaeanism of the narrative level of the story, where it is a matter of absolute good or absolute evil, and an instruction of Frodo and us at the same time. What this story is about is not some comic strip war between, you know, some demonic power of total evil over there and total light over here. That's how it has to be experienced by people inside the story, but underneath it is the deeper, more complex, and absolutely eternal reality. It's going to, well, not eternal, but it's going to exist as long as we exist, as human beings exist. People exist to read this story. That the Saurons and the Morgoths are produced out of our own, our own darkest impulses, the part of ourselves we don't want to look inside and face about ourselves, the fallen part of ourselves. Okay. Um... This is going to be on 356, did I say? I did say that. This is going to be three indentations down from the top of page 356. Mm. Frodo here is, this is an interesting moment in The Lord of the Rings because this is where you see that the background of Galadriel's choice is really kind of awful. Um, if the quest fails and Sauron regains the ring, the ring, which he sees as a real possibility. That's why we see her reconfirming free will. Um, he'll wipe out Lothlorien. He'll have power over uh, Nenya, the, the elven ring that she wears. The three rings will come under the power of the one and Lothlorien, this last home of elven home on Earth, Middle Earth, will be annihilated. It'll become a, a garbage pit the way mortar is, you know, slag heaps and Slag heaps and oily water and nothing growing. Terrible, terrible vision. Um, but if the quest succeeds, if the ring against all odds should be cast into the cracks of doom and be unmade, the power of the elven rings that sustain Lorien is also going to vanish. And, and Lorien will, she says, movingly we will dwindle into a people of, of dell and hollow and be forgotten. That these are the little elves, the tiny little creatures of European folklore. So, Galadriel, bless her, has bad choices, nothing but bad choices. This is a, this is a temptation beyond our conception because, because for her, all choices are bad. The, 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 the quest succeeds and, and everything she loves is, is, is overcome and done away with. The, I mean, uh, the quest fails and everything she, she loves is overcome and done away with. The, the quest succeeds and everything she's done fades. Her own power fades. L Lorien and the power by which it's sustained, which is the power of Nenya, the, one of the three rings, is saying There's no, there are no good choices for Galadriel, and in this context, she's been offered the Ring of Power. She's being offered the Ring of Power, which would allow her to overthrow Sauron and reform the world. Frodo thinks, and this is what she says. Um, Frodo bent his head. This is two indentations down from the top of 356. Frodo bent his head, and what do you wish? He said at last. That what should be shall be, she answered. And the love of the elves for their land and their works is deeper than the deeps of the sea, and their regret is undying and cannot ever be wholly assuaged. Yet they will cast away all away rather than submit to Sauron, for they know him now. For the fate of Lothlorien you are not answerable, but only for the doing of your own task. Yet I could wish, were it of any avail, that the One Ring had never been wrought or had remained forever lost. Now comes this astounding moment. You are wise and fearless and fair, Lady Galadriel, said Frodo. I will give you the ring. I will give you the one ring, if you ask for it. It is too great a matter for me. It is too great a matter for me. And now, this, this is one of my favorite passages in Tolkien. It's extraordinary. Galadriel laughed with a sudden, clear laugh. Wise the Lady Galadriel may be, she said, and yet here she has met her match in courtesy. Gently are you revenged for my testing of your heart at our first meeting. You begin to see with a keen eye. I do not deny that my heart has greatly desired to ask what you offer. For many long years I had pondered what I might do should the great ring come into my hands, and behold, it was brought within my grasp. The evil that was devised long ago works on in many ways, whether Soren himself stands or falls. 
Would not that have been a noble deed to set to the credit of his ring if I had taken it by force or fear from my guest? And now, at last, it comes. You will give me the ring freely. In place of the dark lord, you will set up a queen, and I shall not be dark, but beautiful and terrible as the morning and the night, fair as the sea and the sun and the snow upon the mountain. Dreadful is the storm and the lightning, stronger than the foundations of the earth. All shall love me and despair. She lifted up her hand, and from the ring she wore, there issued a great light that illumined her alone and left all else dark. She stood before Frodo, seeming now tall beyond measurement and beautiful beyond enduring, terrible and worshipful. Then she let her hand fall, and the light faded And suddenly she laughed again, and lo, she was shrunken, a slender elf woman clad in simple white, whose gentle voice was soft and sad. I pass the test, she said. I will diminish and go into the west and remain Galadriel. The crucial sentence in all of that, it's a magnificent scene, it's a magnificent scene. The crucial sentence in all of that is the moment where, just as the light of the ring lights her up and leaves everything else dark, her account of why she may not take the ring lights up our understanding of what the whole story is about. It is the sentence. It is the sentence. The evil that was devised long ago works on in many ways, whether Sauron himself stands or falls. The evil that was devised long ago works on in many ways, whether Sauron himself stands or falls. At that point, what Galadriel realized, I mean, she fulfills this beautifully with the idea of herself as this mighty queen of light who then becomes a queen of darkness. But what she's seen is that if she takes the ring, the ascent of her will to this evil, the evil power that it represents, the power of domination over other people, would inevitably and without fail start to work on her own moral consciousness so that she gradually would cease to be Galadriel, the queen, the Lady of Lothlorien and would become a new dark lord or whatever uh, 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 the female equivalent of a dark lord is. And that the power of, the, 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 the lust for the power of domination which the ring symbolizes when once one once placed on her finger would produce all of Sauron's evil at an immense stretch of time. We've got to assume that it would take somebody of her, her power an enormous time to, to, to be corrupted. That there would be a new dark lord on earth and, and its name would be Galadriel. The evil comes from inside us.